Um, thank you very much. Um, I would just thank, thank you, Andrew, um, for inviting me um, and the opportunity to present at TAG. Um, the work that I'm about to present uh, comes out of a fruitful and ongoing collaboration with fellow artist Louisa Minkin, uh, with collaborations with Andrew and Marta Diaz Guadamino. Where are you, Marta? Yeah, okay. Um, so, but I would like to warn you that the um, we've got some flash photography. I always wanted to say that. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to present some experimentation into RTI. Um, the presentation will include RTI images exported from the RTI viewer and transformed into HD films. Other images I'm going to show you um, will see the RTI interface as snapshots. So there'll be snapshots as examples. Um, the presentation will also intersperse with some art historical images from various sources as an aid to explore the themes and ideas that have been born out of this experimentation. Okay. Um, so we'll start with light. The conditions for all life, as thousands of watts per square meter of filtered solar radiation are absorbed upon the surface of the earth, depositing energy into matter the catalyst for molecular vibration that scatters wavelengths of visible light across the landscape. Light thus becomes a condition of all vision, as Sean Cubitt expertly and extensively writes. As the arc of the sun crosses rock art formations, the flicker of a flame illuminates the painted lines of Chauvet. There are long histories of the desire to control light, and it becomes the crux of modernity through Newton's law of optics, setting a dialectic that Goethe would grapple with when saying, we can never directly see what is true. We look at only in the reflection. Uh, light for Goethe was a crucial channel between the human and the divine, considering the problem of how, on the one hand, things can act upon the mind, and on the other, how the mind acts upon the world. This dialectic was perhaps best illustrated by the late 19th and early 20th century European painting, where the tensions between the impact of natural light and color on the eye, an aesthetic based on truth to nature, would be opposed by an equally absolute assertion of the critically individual eye of the artist at the moment of perception. This struggle for the location of meaning between the exterior law of physics and the interior subjectivity of the human senses continues to play out, uh, quite possibly in the synthetic images of which RTI is one. So here we are with the Fulton drums thrust into the limelight, caught in the glare, startled in the media spotlight, continuing in its arc of exhumation. Limelight, the combustion of a lump of calcium oxide, first known as coniophostic lighting and used on the Hern Bay Pier in 1836 to illuminate the magic acts of a Ching Lao Loro. He was possibly a Cornishman and the first European to practice sitting in the air upon nothing, as known as the ethereal suspension illusion. According to reports, the whole pier was overwhelmed by a flood of beautiful white light, illuminating and capturing the act of magic. Limelight, the term still endures even after the coniophostic light's obsolescence, it's common parlance for the focus of attention on a mediated object in the public eye. The RTI of the Folkton drums was my first experience of this glare, and I too was caught in the spell, asking the questions of what can RTI bring to light again, and what can it revive and restore? This question was posed when Louisa Minker and I took the RTI process into some derelict spaces within South London housing estate, Taplow House, Many of the rooms in Taplow House had been closed since the 1970s. A cab office, a butcher's, a laundrette. And after yesterday's interesting session by Thane Farstevall from the Arctic in the University of Norway, perhaps these rooms could be classed as hyper art installations, dislocated spaces unattached from their previous usages. In the darkness, Louisa and I traversed the space still lives revealed through the stroboscopic activity of the flash. There are arrangements of midden, accumulation, flotsam, jetsam and lagan architecture spaces 
waiting to be salvaged, the first layers of the archaeological process. The relationship to the reflections and refractions in Manet's bar at the Folie Bergère, I think are pronounced. Incidentally, the balcony of Tarpole House points northwards towards the Courtauld Institute and the painting's home. The painting and Foucault's lecture on it, which describe it, its well-known features, the entanglement of three components, the space, the lighting, and the view which occurs through a mirror, the lens, situated parallel to the picture plate and encompassing the whole canvas, so that everything in front of the mirror and within the painting is also found within the reflection. Yet, due to the impossibility of the position of all the components, the painting becomes an image that the viewer can move around. The strafing within the shadows of RTI often do something similar, capturing ghost activities, as you can see on the left of that image. The shadow, a vast penumbra of Western art, used to conjure what's not there and to prophesize with ghost stories of demons and hobgoblins, but once adopted to describe form, it has never been discarded. Used in second century mosaics to animate litter and titbits on the floor. The mosaic pattern is strangely analogous to the physiology of the eye, as described by the German physician and physicist Helmholtz, who speaks of the rods and cones of the retina as a regular mosaic pattern. Here, perhaps, both the shadow and the description of detritus is acting as a kind of physical index for the passage of time. The accumulation of dirt and dust is not only an index, but a projection the shadow becoming the key feature in spatial measurement as illustrated by Man Ray's photograph of dust breeding on the surface of Duchamp's large glass. The shadow, the preeminent technique for the creation, for creating relations between objects and their environments. We can only see what we are looking for, wrote Alphonse Bertillon, and we look for what is already in our minds. Bertillon, a police car clerk who, against the grain, introduced biometrics and anthropometry to law enforcement by developing composite photography, dividing the face into discrete units of information. Psychology at the time was questioning the reliability of human memory. Eyewitness, tes eyewitness testimony was not to be trusted, and by merging measurements, plans and calculations with photography, Bertillon began to pioneer forensic science. Bertillon, who came from a family of statisticians, developed a formal structure of photography, allowing for reinvestigation of the crime scene with the aim to, and I quote, produce directly with no instrument other than the lens photographs which could be utilised as actual geometric plans in the cross section, elevation and horizontal projection, and which, with the aid of simple rules and calculations, would be capable of providing the shapes and exact dimensions of the objects shown. Recording was under a strict standardised condition by an overhead camera fitted with wide-angle lenses <coughs> atop of a two-metre-tall tripod. The images taken are from a superhuman point of view, mounted on special cards with perspectometric measurements which enabled reproduction <coughs> of the plan and a transformation of the photograph into planimetric drawings. This elaborate representation system was even applied to the, applied to the morgue in order that all photography could be used as an analytic tool. Back to Taplow House. The cab office, a room set out in quadrants, was unwittingly used to create a, a clock. Placing the cue ball within the central space, the RTI ordered the shadows from the flashlight, creating a synthetic sundial. Other experiments involved placing the cue ball at junctions between spaces so that the geometry of the space would be revealed via the process. And showing these images was what uh, uh, the, the, the term dirty RTI came out from these particular um, versions of RTI. Any studying of imaging is a study into the devices that have created them. Visualizations, whether digital or analog, are always constructions. As Carlo Rubia, the particle physicist said, detectors are really just a way to express yourself. 
The detector is the image of the guy who designed it. When, instrument, when instruments produce images, they are fundamentally experimental. They are not unmediated truths. In fact, the mediation affects the event itself. Visual media are interventions into the physical processes of the world. The world does not exist as data. It must be produced as data, as Qubit puts it. And optical tricks are often the byproducts of scientific endeavour and the great quest to understand nature brought fashion to lenses. Samuel Pepys even frequented the shop of Richard Reeves's, where microscopes, telescopes, magic lanterns were avidly sought. Spectacles invented in Pisa in the 13th century and eyeglasses to fix faulty vision were by the 17th century in general use to the wealthy and they were offered alongside sextants, telescopes and compasses. One could also find fantastical eyeglasses, devices that multiply the object's view, as the saying went at the time. These are the pleasurable spectacles for avaricious persons that love gold and silver. For one piece uh, will seem many, or one heap of money will seem a treasury. Uh, these particular lenses influenced the type of optical painting that could be viewed through a special perspective glass. Here, the image didn't just proliferate, but instead it fragments, um, and the scene would align into a coherent new image. In this instance, the bust of 12 Ottoman rulers combined to form a portrait of King Louis VIII. A tuft of the hair from one, a nose from another, are drawn together. This influenced Hobbes's cover for Leviathan, where we can see in the towering figure of Leviathan composed of innumerable small figures. There is no power on earth to compare to him, it states, and Hobbes's frontispiece illustrates the translation of new optical te technology into political and religious spheres. One might say Tapel of House is twinned with Tapas Low, the 7th century Anglo-Saxon burial mound located 60 miles upstream of the Thames. This mound dominates the environment and must have been the focus of legend and curiosity. In 1883, a group of antiquarians excavated the mound with a zeal only outmatched by their incompetence, uh, uh, producing contradictory plans of the burial chamber and failing to keep any systematic records of their observations. The extraordinary array of grave goods from the Kentish East that lay around the body signal the dead man's power and hint at the politics and power struggles of the early Anglo-Saxon period. Eastwards, and firmly in Kentish territory, Taplow House has its own political dimensions. Built between 1963 and 1970, the estate is one of the most imposing in Europe and one of the last to be built using the now defunct LPS, large panel system of fabricated concrete slabs. This style, along with its raised walkways, almost immediately became synonymous with its decline, and it is here where Tony Blair gave his first public speech as Prime Minister, standing high on the balcony, saluting out towards the country. These estates are under regeneration. Artist projects are part of the first wave of gentrification, as new blocks of incremental housing and dispersal architecture are constructed. <coughs> Turning the RTI process onto the camera, in on itself, making a recursive loop was an interesting question. What would be caught of the flashlights, the flares in the film? Isolating the camera in a mirror and allowing the light to play across its surface was evocative of the aesthetic power of film noir, whose style involved the manipulation of light and shade as much as that of the actors. The strength of movement of light, first enhancing the body of the camera before being unmade when the light hits the lens, as the multiple flashpoint marks are printed on the retina of the camera lens, like a Mandelbrot set, um, follows on from uh, 1971 with the aid of a couple of mirrors where John Hilliard photographs a camera using seven different apertures and 10 different shutter speeds. The resultant work, a grid of 70 photographs, is a recording of the phase space of the 35 millimeter camera as apparatus A camera recording its own condition illustrates the dialectical position that with every photograph, the photographic program becomes purer by one possibility, whilst the photographic universe becomes richer by one realization. 
And here, with this RTI, I've captured a 360 degree camera, utilizing the lens as a spherical cue ball. And what this has also enabled me to do is to record from the viewpoint of the 360 degree camera. This ensuing film becomes another form of grammatology. The spherical coding and the lens flare make an another, uh, uh, another new image from a post optical position. Fish eye lenses of security cameras have become a point of fascination too. The camera lens as a key ball takes the recursion further still. Um, continuing the themes of the post optical, optical I've explored RTI. Oh, I've been rereading this, sorry, I've got a little bit. This is my final little section. Um, uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, well, it's self-explanatory. So these are two from an underpass of RTIs, whereby the, the, the um, spherical, the convex mirror is being used as a spherical key ball. And finally, What would it be like to invert the process uh, of using a static light whilst reloading the camera, uh, whilst relocating the camera as being the moving uh, uh, part of the operation? So by making a jig of the cue ball, I've experimented by creating unstable RTI. And these last two slides are, are uh, RTI used by using that method. Um, this one is of a figurine of Michael Jackson. You can, you can kind of grasp um, his Michael Jackson uh, uh, fedora hat every now and again, coming into that. And this one is of a uh, Kylie Minogue figurine. Um, and with this one, you just start to sort of see the constant in this, which is the contraption which holds the black cue ball in place so the camera can be moved whilst the flash remains static. And in true tag style, I'm not also going to have a conclusion. Uh, I'm going to leave it open with these images. <laughs>